Hello class and welcome to lecture notes for unit 2, A More Perfect Union. In these notes we'll be talking about the forming of a new government. We'll be talking about American life under the Articles of Confederation. We'll also address the Constitutional Convention. And finally we will wrap up talking about the Federalist and Anti-Federalist debates. To start off we're going to talk about the United States in the early part of the country. So in the early part of the country the fear that many people had was that the government would become too strong. They were fighting a war against the British, who had a strong central government in the form of a king and a parliament, and so they wanted to create a government that did not have these issues. It's important to remember at this time in history, people believed themselves as citizens of their state first and their nation second. So citizens of New York would see themselves as New Yorkers first rather than Americans first. People also feared that if a country tried to rule over an area that was too large, the country would end up failing. And so they wanted to keep the power more localized at the state level. As a result, the states at the time had more power than the national government. Each state formed their own state constitution, which set up the governments that mostly ruled people in the new nation. So most power was held at the state level. Most laws were taken care of at the state level, and the national government did not have very much power at this time. Most constitutions were formed during the Revolutionary Period, and some of them even used their original colonial charters, such as Rhode Island. Some of these states' constitutions were very bold. States such as Pennsylvania allowed all white men over the age of 21 to vote, whereas most states required voters to own property. States like New Jersey actually even also allowed women to vote as long as they were property holders. And this continued on until 1807 before it was removed from the Constitution of New Jersey. Most states, however, restricted the right to vote to white male landowners. This left out non-landowners, women, freed African Americans, and Native Americans from being able to vote. The structure of the national government was set up by a document called the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation were adopted in 1781, and they set up the structure of the government. Under the Articles of Confederation, the national government had the authority to make laws and carry out those laws. They could conduct war, they could conduct foreign relations, they could spend money, and they could borrow money. However, the Articles of Confederation did not allow the national government to collect taxes, there was no judicial or executive branch, and they couldn't regulate trade or draft soldiers. Each state would have a single vote in the legislature, and nine states would be required for any measure to pass. If they wanted to change the Articles of Confederation, it would require all states to agree to the change, and unanimous votes were very hard to come by. Therefore, it was very difficult to change the powers that the national government had under the Articles of Confederation. In addition, it was really hard to pass any laws when it required nine of the states to vote for any measure in order for it to pass. The government under the Articles of Confederation did have some successes. They were able to conduct the American Revolution and settle a peace treaty following the war. They also were able to settle the competing land issues that states had on lands claimed in the western areas. They also had a way to organize and survey the land. While these examples show that the national government was able to complete some things, there were also a number of weaknesses under the Articles of Confederation. For example, under the Articles of Confederation, the government was unable to enforce the Treaty of Paris, which ended the American Revolution. Following the Revolution, the British refused to leave some forts in the Great Lakes region, and they also refused to repay slave owners for slaves who had left in order to fight on the side of the British in exchange for their freedom. Additionally, the Articles of Confederation made it difficult to conduct diplomacy. Other countries weren't sure if they were dealing with one country or if they were dealing with 13 small countries. So, for example, Minister to London John Adams was unable to resolve the issues regarding the Treaty of Paris when he met with the government in England. There were similar issues in diplomacy when dealing with Spain in regards to the border between the United States and Florida, as well as access to the Mississippi. For example, a treaty was agreed to with Spain that meant that the United States wouldn't have access to the Mississippi River. Southern states were not happy about this as it was an important way to get products down to s ports like New Orleans. As a result, southern states blocked the ratification of the treaty. Another weakness was that the Articles of Confederation couldn't effectively deal with interstate issues. 
They could request money, for example, to help pay back debts, but the states themselves could decide whether or not they were going to pay and how much they were going to pay. Finally, the government under the Articles of Confederation also were ineffective in dealing with Native Americans in the Western territories. The legislature tried to pressure Native American tribes into giving up lands, but ultimately they were unsuccessful and violence between Native Americans and settlers in the West began to increase, peaking in the 1790s. American life under the Articles of Confederation did have many difficulties. One area that was successful was the management of Western lands. In 1784 and 1785, the legislature passed two land ordinances. Following the American Revolution, a flood of settlers moved westward, and by 1790, there were over 120,000 citizens residing in the Western lands. This caused a lot of friction between the Western settlers and their Eastern governments. There were clashes over taxes, trade, and Native American policies. In 1784, the Ordinance of 1784 was passed, and it divided these Western territories into 10 districts. Each of these districts would be able to petition for statehood when the population reached the same size as the smallest state currently in the United States. A second land ordinance was passed in 1785. The Ordinance of 1785 created a system to survey and sell Western lands that were located north of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi. This system divided up the land into square blocks that were six miles by six miles, and these blocks were called townships. Each township was then subdivided into 36 one-square-mile blocks. The blocks were then sold for a minimum of $1 an acre. These one-square-mile blocks contained 640 acres. Therefore, in order to buy one of these blocks, you would need $640. At the time, $640 would be the equivalent of about $15,000 in today's money. This made it really hard for ordinary people to come up with that much cash. And so as a result, average people weren't able to buy Western lands and instead it favored land speculators. These land speculators would buy land and hold it as the land value increased and then sold it for a profit. Two years later in 1787, the Northwest Ordinance was passed. This ordinance got rid of the 10 districts from the 1784 ordinance and instead created one territory of land north of the Ohio River and east of the Mississippi. This allowed the territory to be divided into three to five states in the future and set the population needed to become a state at 60,000 people. The ordinance also guaranteed that if you moved into these new territories, you would still have freedom of religion, you'd have right to a trial by jury, and it also prohibited slavery in the territory. This was an important point because it was the first time that the national government put a prohibition on slavery in one of the territories that it governed. The biggest concern during this period was economic. There was a lot of debt still as a result of the American Revolution. Three years after the war ended, the country still owed around $50 million. That's the equivalent of about one and a quarter billion dollars in modern currency. States that had ports started to put taxes on goods that were heading out of state, and this led to a lot of friction between neighboring states. There was also an economic depression that made things worse, and it lasted from 1784 until 1787. Ultimately, there was not enough money going around, and that stopped the economy from growing. The national government still also had a large debt to the soldiers who had fought during the American Revolution. However, because the national government was unable to tax, there was no way for it to raise the money to pay back this debt. The only thing it could do was request the money from the states, and unfortunately, they only received about one-sixth of the money that they requested. They could barely pay for the operating expenses for the government, much less the debt itself. In an effort to solve this issue, Robert Morris, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison proposed a continental impost. This was a tariff of 5% on any imported goods coming to the United States. Many Americans feared that this would lead toward a concentration of power. And so when they attempted to pass the impost in 1781, all but one state passed it, Rhode Island. And because this was a change to the Articles of Confederation, it required unanimous support. So Rhode Island was able to block this from passage. They tried again in 1783, but again, they were not able to get a unanimous vote. This left states with the job of taxing their citizens 
to deal with the financial issues at hand. Much of this fell on farmers, who felt that the taxes were unfair and tyrannical. They thought it was benefiting the rich. And so as a result, mobs began to riot in especially the New England area starting in the 1780s. Many of these people rallied around a former Continental Army soldier named Daniel Shays. Shays had a few demands that he wanted, including tax relief, a temporary stop to debt collection, and the use of paper money to help farmers pay their debts more easily. Daniel Shays organized his men into a military force that traveled around the countryside, going to courthouses to try and stop them from operating. They also worked to stop sheriffs from being able to sell confiscated property. Shays and his men eventually moved toward the weapons depot located in Springfield, Massachusetts. They wanted to get the weapons there so that they could expand their revolt. The state militia met them in Springfield, Massachusetts. They exchanged fire, and some of Shays' followers died, and the rest scattered into the countryside. This effectively ended Shays' rebellion, but there were some short-term gains. Daniel Shays and many of his leaders were pardoned for their actions, and some of them even had their debts removed. However, the rebellion did have national consequences. Nationalists were calling for a convention and held one in 1786 in Annapolis. Only five states attended, but at this convention they discussed the economic issues that the government under the Articles of Confederation just couldn't solve. After seeing Shays' Rebellion, they called for another convention in Philadelphia. The Shays' Rebellion added urgency to produce a new constitution that could more effectively deal with the problems that were leading to revolts like Shays'. Some, like Thomas Jefferson, feared that Shays' Rebellion would be used as an excuse to create a tyrannical central government. Jefferson wrote, A little rebellion now and then is a good thing, and as necessary in the political world as storms are in the physical. However, others like Washington, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton began to speak out about the weaknesses in the current government under the Articles of Confederation. Washington stated, There are combustibles in every state in which a spark might set fire to. And so in May of 1787, a convention was held in Philadelphia. This convention became known as the Constitutional Convention. Because of the growing unrest in the country and the financial issues that were being faced by the nation, this time 12 states sent delegates, Rhode Island being the only state not to. Most of these delegates were under 42. Some of them were rich, but many of them were not. Many of them were well educated. And among them was George Washington, which immediately gave the convention credibility. He was unanimously voted to preside over the sessions. So over the next four months, the delegates at the Constitutional Convention drafted the United States Constitution that we have today. James Madison had a central role in this, and he became known as the father of the Constitution. The Constitution had a lot of influences from the past, one of the first being the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was passed in 1215 in England, and it set the precedent of limited government. The Magna Carta limited the power of the king. He was no longer an absolute ruler. He had to consult with the nobles, and it eventually helped them establish a parliament. Some of the protections in the Bill of Rights come from protections that were passed due to the Magna Carta. Some of these rights include the right to a speedy trial by jury, or freedom from unlawful search and seizure, as well as the protection from loss of life, liberty, and property without the due process of law. The Constitution was also greatly influenced by the philosophers of the Enlightenment. The most influential would be John Locke. John Locke believed that governments gained their power from the consent of the governed, which we call popular sovereignty today. The role of the government, according to John Locke, was to protect the natural rights of people, which included life, liberty, and property. He believed in representative government, but only a representative government where men of property or business were allowed to participate. Those who didn't own property would not have voting rights. He also believed that if a government failed to do the things that it was supposed to, such as secure the rights of the people, then it was the right of the people to therefore rise up and revolt against that government. Many of these ideas can be seen in the Declaration of Independence. For example, Thomas Jefferson wrote that 
all people are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish and to institute new governments. Those ideas came directly from John Locke. Another important figure is Charles Montesquieu. Montesquieu believed that the purpose of the government was to maintain law and order, political liberty, and individual property. He believed in the ideas of separation of power that divided government into three branches, and these branches would then be able to check and balance the power of the others. This made sure that no branch became too powerful. And last, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau believed in popular participation in government. He believed in the idea of a direct democracy where every single citizen has a say in what happens, rather than having a representative republic. He believed in the ideas of a social contract, which were first discussed by Thomas Hobbes. Uh, Thomas Hobbes believed that there was a social contract between the people and their king. Rousseau instead believed that there was a contract between the people and themselves, and that the people would give up some of their freedom to each other in order to create a government of laws that worked for the good of the community as a whole. So these Enlightenment thinkers had a big influence on the formation of the Constitution. Within the Constitutional Convention, there were a lot of divisions. The members ruled that each state would get one vote in the convention and that the majority would win, so it would not be unanimous agreement as it is with the Articles of Confederation. However, they didn't agree on much after that. Virginia Delegate Edmund Randolph made a proposal for a system of government that had no executive branch. The legislative branch would be divided into two houses. The lower house would have representation based on population and each state would be proportionally represented, so larger states would therefore have more representatives than smaller states. The upper house would be selected by the lower house. Under this plan, Virginia would have 10 times more representatives than the smallest state at the time, which was Delaware. This plan became known as the Virginia Plan, and it was a completely new plan of government. It ignored the Articles of Confederation and set up something brand new. As a result, small states objected and William Patterson of New Jersey called for a different system. He called for a federal system that would have one house in the legislature that had equal representation. He called to expand the power to tax and the power to regulate commerce. Basically, his plan would just be a revision to the Articles of Confederation, not a new plan for government. This plan became known as the New Jersey Plan. The other issue that states debated at the Constitutional Convention was the status of slaves. States disagreed over how to count slaves for population of each state. And if the population of the state determined representatives and taxation, those numbers would be very important. Slave states like South Carolina wanted slaves to count as persons for representation. Therefore, they would end up with more representatives in the legislature. However, they did not want slaves counted when calculating taxes. States where slavery was ending did not like this plan. Instead, they wanted slaves to be counted for taxation, but they did not want them counted for representation. As a result of all these debates and disagreements, compromises would need to be made. In July of 1787, a committee was formed to come up with a great compromise. The compromise they reached created a bicameral legislature. It would have an upper house, that gave each state equal representation. So each state would get two representatives in the upper house. It then created a lower house that would have representatives based on the population of the states. Therefore, larger states would get more representatives than smaller states. The delegates also needed to come to a compromise on the issue of slavery. The compromise they settled on would count three-fifths of the slave population when determining representation and taxation. As a note, this did not give any rights to slaves, and the Constitution actually does not even refer to slaves, but rather calls them all other persons. The Constitution also didn't count any Native Americans living within the state. 
the southern states also feared that this new constitution would affect the profitable cotton economy. So as a result, the convention agreed to some terms to benefit the southern states. For one, the new legislature would not be able to tax exports. So all the cotton produced and exported would not be taxed. They also would not be able to set a tax on imported slaves of more than $10, and the new government would not be able to stop the international slave trade for 20 years. These terms bothered people who had moral objections to the institution of slavery. However, in the end, they decided to go along with it so they would be sure that the Constitution would pass. Once the Constitution was completed, it was sent out to the states for ratification. This led to a public debate on whether or not the Constitution should be accepted. On the one side, there was the Federalists. Federalists supported the new Constitution. These Federalists were well organized, and they had the support of key American figures such as George Washington and Benjamin Franklin. Three prominent Federalists were James Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton. They were fierce advocates for the new Constitution, and in an effort to try and persuade the citizens of the states to support this new constitution, they wrote a series of 85 essays that became known as the Federalist Papers. In these papers, they called their opponents anti-federalists and implied that they had nothing to offer except opposition to the current plan. Federalists emphasized the separation of powers and the systems of checks and balances and discussed how these things would protect the nation from a tyrannical ruler. Federalists ultimately feared disorder, anarchy, chaos, and they also were worried about the power of the masses, the power of the average person. And so they created a representative republic and supported one that provided some checks and some space between the average citizen and their government. Uh, these are seen in things such as the Electoral College. The Anti-Federalists, on the other hand, had figures such as Patrick Henry and George Mason. Anti-Federalists were also joined by yeoman farmers who lived in the rural parts of America. Anti-Federalists argued that they were the defenders of the true principles of the revolution. They believed that this new constitution would betray those principles and create a strong central government. The strong central government would result in increased taxes, and they believed it would favor the well-born, the rich, and the powerful. They thought that the Constitution would end individual liberty, and their biggest complaint was that it didn't have a Bill of Rights that would protect those individual liberties. They believed that any centralized power would eventually lead to despotism. They believed that no government could be trusted to protect liberties of citizens. Anti-Federalists wanted stability too, just like their Federalist opponents. However, they were afraid of a concentration in power. They didn't like that the new Constitution placed barriers between the people and their government, which was precisely the things that the Federalists did like about the new Constitution. The public debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists continued on But the ratification also continued on, and Delaware became the first state to ratify the new Constitution, and they did so unanimously. New Hampshire became the ninth state to ratify, and this was officially enough for the Constitution to go into effect. However, there was still some worry about the lack of a Bill of Rights, and so Federalists offered the addition of amendments to the Constitution that would protect citizens' rights. Once the Constitution was ratified, The new Congress proposed 12 amendments, and of these 12, 10 were accepted, and they became known as the Bill of Rights. Once ratified, the Constitution went into effect, and elections began in 1789. Many supported the Constitution because they believed that the first president would be George Washington, someone that they trusted. And indeed, he was elected the first president with the leading Federalist John Adams as his vice president. On April 30th, 1789, Washington took the oath of office on the balcony of Federal Hall in the capital city of New York. Thank you for listening to this lecture on the early years of the United States. You can find more information on the Magna Carta and the Federalist Papers at the Library of Congress and information on the Constitution from the Constitutional Rights Foundation. Both of these sources were used to help make this presentation.